Oh. Hi, Bill. Hi, how are you, Karen? Very good. I'm really happy to have you here today and uh, happy to have everybody who's listening. And I want to introduce to all of you Bill Harries, who's the Chief Scientist for Aramix Corporation. And Aramix is a very interesting corporation because they're working on digitizing human taste and smell to turn it into actionable data. And uh, it says here that Bill has uh, many years of research experience with integral membrane proteins, and that's kind of how he got into this business. But I was wondering, Bill, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, how you grew up, how you got interested in science in the first place, what led you into this career, mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe tell us about your walk of faith at the same time. Sure, love to. Um, my uh, upbringing was pretty unremarkable, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, no great trauma. My uh, parents were college-educated people. They ins always instilled uh, an enthusiasm for inquiry and science. And, and um, you know, back in, in when I grew up, uh, kids were sort of kicked out of the house and, you know, to come back at dinner time essentially and they spent the rest of the day outside exploring the world around us and i grew up in western new york which is a, a wonderful place to uh, grow up near buffalo so nice distinct seasons and um lots fun, of fun things to do all year round um and uh my grandparents were very influential in my life and 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 actually in my faith also um both of my grandfathers were um, gardeners, and that really instilled a, a love of gardening in, in my life and, and the wonder of growing things and living things. And I think that's one of the sort of foundational experiences I had, which made me go into biology as opposed to something else like engineering or, or anything else, really. Uh, I wanted to go and study life um, because I found it so fascinating. Even from a very young age. Um, I was, my father was an uh, electrical engineer, so he had a, a sort of a scientific engineering background, and um, that always helped, and he was very instrumental in, in uh, sort of piquing my interest and, and uh, sort of delighting me with little tidbits of how interesting the world is. And um, that's sort of where I got my start in, in science. Uh, I also got, I sort of inherited my father's chemistry set at a young age, and that was back when chemistry sets really had real chemicals that did real things. <laughs> back when they were dangerous, right? That was when they were dangerous, yes. But that was part so, of Did you ever blow anything up? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll, I'll just think, I'll leave it at that. Yes, we blew, blew things up. Because of all the reactions on Earth, the fast ones are always the most interesting ones. Um, so, um, I went through, you know, elementary school and, um, it, well, I'll sort of digress back to my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, Charles Nelson, was a very faithful Christian and a uh, contemporary of, of Billy Graham's. And, um, actually, one of our cousins was uh, the music director for Billy Graham, John Peterson. And so there was always a very strong, Christian ethic and uh, teaching in our in our family, so um, that was always a part of our our upbringing, um, and that was formative, I think, in 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 many of the things I did and the way I sort of directed my life. Um, I you know was always interested in science in in uh, grade grade school and uh, high school, but really high school was just boring. It was more like jail to me. I wanted to, I was always looking out the window wishing I was outside rather than being inside. And um, my, I was the youngest of three kids, so I have two older sisters. And my middle sister, Julie, was, um, I was always helping her with her science homework, even though she was three years older than I was. So by the time I got to that grade level, I more or less knew what the science was about, and uh, school was 
therefore not very interesting at that point. So I was never very, a very good student at that period of my life, um, which is odd because I spent so many years being a student after that. Um, I went off to college and um, my freshman year, I was a, a dual major. I was interested in philosophy, mainly I think because of my belief. And, uh, but I was also wanted to pursue a science um, path. So I was, I tried to do a double major philosophy and biology, which uh, was really way too much for me at, at that point, especially because I wasn't a very good student. I didn't have very good study habits. And um, so it was, uh, it was hard going. And I, uh, after the first couple of semesters, I dropped the philosophy um, major simply because I couldn't do very well. I realized that. And also because I found the, 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 the dialogue sort of boring. I wasn't really interested in how many angels could dance on the head of a pin or things like that. Just that kind of dialogue didn't interest me. It didn't seem to be something that answered any of the questions that I had about the universe. So I, I just want to interject a little something here because your experience is very similar to mine in, in terms of the way that philosophy struck you when you were in college, in undergraduate work. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't take it as a major, but I had to take philosophy as a part of my, my college degree. Mm -hmm. And I found it just unutterably boring. I slept through almost every class. And, I, and now it's so strange to me because now it, completely fascinating to me and I don't understand was it the way they were teaching it then or um, they just seemed to atomize everything into these little pieces that were com that didn't have anything whatever to do with life but, right. but then I was also I was not a Christian at the time and I was taking it in a secular school and that may be why it didn't fit into any part of what I would consider life. Right. Um, but now I just find philosophy fascinating. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Well, when, and when I was a philosophy major that first semester or so, I, I sort of had a conversation with God and I said, God, I'm going to you know, start looking at things that are outside my normal areas of understanding. I'm going to be learning about things that are, I'm sure, contrary to Christian teachings. And uh, I'm just going to keep an open mind, but understand that I always know you're there, and I can always fall back to you. And um, and that's really, unfortunately, it's sort of um, regulated my 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 life, my Christian life, to a very low level for probably 30 years. So I I just saw the video from Psy. Um, who was a biochemist, and I saw the same sort of parallels in his uh, career where, he, as a Christian, you just don't really make a big deal out of it. Um, you know, I freely said I was a Christian to people who were interested in it later on in life, um, but I didn't advertise it because I didn't need the hassle. And when you're a graduate student, for instance, you're the low person on the totem pole, you don't have any power, and you don't have to really stimulate ridicule from your your professors or anybody else. So you sort of keep your head down as a Christian. Um, but you know you don't have to give up everything. And I didn't anyway. And uh, that was good. Well so during those years when you were keeping your head down, um, did you see a conflict between your faith and the science you were learning or was it seamless for you? You know, that was funny because I never, I never really saw a conflict between science and my belief in religion at all. It all fit, it could all fit together. Yes, there were inconsistencies, but where aren't there consistencies in the world? But um, I had no trouble being a good scientist and, and being a good Christian. There was no place in my, you know, I didn't... I believe in evolution, for instance, but it's just not sort of the typical belief in evolution. You know, I think God works in mysterious ways, and I think evolution is one of them. 
Um, I'm not a, liter a literalist on, on the Bible uh, because of, I know who wrote it and when they wrote it, and I know their understanding was limited. And so they interpreted things in a certain way, and that's fine. That was a contemporary way of understanding things and, and expressing things. But much like today, when we don't know how something works, we, we fall back on old beliefs or whatever as, as a basis, a foundation for our understanding. And then we go from there as we, as we learn more. And so I really don't see too much inconsistent with, with the belief in evolution. Maybe it's not exactly the way it happened in the Bible, but that's okay in my belief system anyway. Um, uh, and, and, and I've seen that in a lot of things, um, many different basic principles that people think are incompatible with religion that really aren't. Mm -hmm. I just didn't spend much time worrying about it because it didn't seem to be productive for me to worry about that kind of thing. Well, so when you were working on your biology, were you doing a lot of work on cell biology or were you more at the, the organism level or? Good question. Um, well, going, getting back to my education, I, I was after um, my undergraduate degree, I got a master's degree in, in biology also. And that the research component, I was always very interested in the research. I had fun in the lab. That's where I wanted to be. Um, my research focus was on immunohistochemistry of the eye. So I was looking at using different techniques to identify enzymes that were produced in the lens of the eye. I had a very, a very charismatic mentor in my master's degree, he was an Indian, a Hindu, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Dr. Naleen Unakar, and he was a morphologist. So he studied how cells looked, and with crude techniques back then through early electron microscopes, looked at the cells and tried to figure out what they were doing. And um, Dr. Yanaker's sort of motivation for studying vision, he, he was looking at a, trying to figure out how to prevent cataract formation. So cataracts are the leading cause of blindness in the world. And in the third world, especially, um, to be blind is just, debilitating you're just it's just the worst thing that can happen to somebody just about that um to be blind um the third world doesn't have many crosswalks for handicapped people or traffic signals that uh, talk to you and things like that it's a very difficult world when you're blind or you're uh, vision impaired so uh, dr yanaka instilled in me this excitement to go look and try to see if we could figure out how cataracts form uh, either by sickness or old age or by radiation or a number of different ways that cataracts form. And uh, in the meantime, we saw, we got to study some of the coolest areas of the body. I mean, the visual system is, is just cool no matter what you, you think. I mean, no matter how much you know about it, you can't help but wonder at how cool it is and, and how wonderful it is that you get this, this way of sensing the, uh, the universe. And, um, it, and, and I would spend hours on the electron microscope because I could delve down into a world that nobody ever sees. And that was one of the neat things. I mean, I sort of came at the tail end of the, the traditionist, traditional morphologist. So I was maybe 10 or 15 years after some of the great cellular biologists who used electron microscopes to peer into the cell at the first time at very, very high magnification and resolution. So they were the ones that really saw the nucleus and the mitochondria and the ribosomes for the first time. And, and um, there was still much to learn, but sort of the, the big things were already been discovered by the time I came through. And I was just you know, trying to catch up with my studies and try to visualize what was happening in the cell by using different techniques. And we, that's what we were trying to do, is figure out how cataracts form and how we could block it. And, and in that study, I studied one particular protein at the time was called MP26 or MIP26. It was a, a 26,000 molecular weight protein, and it made up a huge percentage of the membrane of the lens of the eye. About 30, 40% of the protein of the lens of the eye was this, of the lens 
membrane was this protein. And uh, we thought at first it was um, something called a gap junction, which is a connection between two adjacent cells. So it's like uh, one cell will have what's called a hemiconexon or a half of a connexon, and another cell will have the other hemiconexon. They come together and they form a channel that uh, all sorts of things can go through. Water can go through and so ions and, and messenger, messenger molecules from one cell to another. And that's how a tissue maintains homeostasis and also acts as a tissue rather than just a, a group of independent cells. And um, as we found out, it wasn't a gap junction, but that took about 25 years. I spent 30 years just on that protein alone, studying that protein and what it did. And uh, as it turned out, it was a water channel. And uh, the lens of the eye is, is a profoundly dry tissue. It's one of the driest tissues in the body. And it has to be dry so that the proteins remain crystal clear. If the lens of the eye gets, uh, if water goes into the lens of the eye, it, it hydrates proteins called the crystallins, which are very beautifully organized molecular proteins and uh, it disrupts their transparency and you get a, you get a uh, cataract. And so we were looking at different ways the cataracts form. And um, I went through my master's looking at the um, at cataracts and then I started a PhD in cell biology and human anatomy. And um, I continued looking at the uh, gap junction protein, the MIP26. And um, I spent my PhD six years trying to figure out what was degrading this protein. So we noticed that when the, when the disease, when cataracts form, we found that the uh, protein was degraded. It went from a 26,000 molecular weight protein to a 24 molecular weight protein. And I was trying to find in my PhD, what was the agent that was cutting that protein down? And, and I thought causing uh, cataract formation. So um, that went very well until late in my career, people finally figured out that it was not a, uh, that MIP26 was not a, a uh, gap junction protein, but rather, well, we didn't know what it was, but it, it obviously from very high resolution pictures, it had a, a pore in the middle. So we knew it, it was some kind of channel protein. And um, work continued on as uh, after I graduated my PhD and I started teaching, I, um, I had to sort of put down the research uh, lab coat for a while and, and make some money and uh, start my career. And so I did a lot of teaching and I didn't have time or facilities to do too much research at that point, but the research went on and we found out that this was a water channel. And that was another interesting part of the research was a very simple question is how's wa how does water get in and out of cells? And um, if you would have asked anybody that had a biology degree, they would have given you the sort of the, the pat answer of, oh, cells drink through different mechanisms and uh, that's how it works. But if you do the mathematics, there was no way that these little cellular drinking episodes of what they call pinocytosis or, or phagocytosis can never get enough water, especially in, in glandular tissues like ear ducts or salivary glands or mammary glands. There's just no way that you can have water. You cannot have those liquids be made in those volumes by that, by that method. So I, as I was sort of doing research on the side of my teaching career, I started looking even more on how we could figure out these water channels and how they work. And um, after about 25 years of teaching, I moved to California and I got a professorship uh, in San Francisco. And um, I was teaching at a Jesuit university in San Francisco, teaching uh, genetics, which was interesting, teaching sort of modern genetics in a in a Catholic church, in a Catholic school, but they were very good. They were very, you know, they had, they didn't constrain me in any way about teaching about evolution or Mendelian genetics and things like that. Um, 
but uh, I got uh, I heard a, a lecture from a postdoc from uh, a laboratory in uh, UCSF, which was right across the Golden Gate Park, and I. Uh, it was intriguing because it was one of the proteins that was very similar to MIT26. And I um, uh, went over and talked to the PI, Bob Stroud at uh, UCSF, who was a structural biologist. And the structural biologist sort of looks at high resolution pictures of proteins and tries to figure out how they work by looking at high resolution pictures and doing other biochemical and biophysical um, experiments also. but. Really, if you can use techniques like X-ray crystallography um, to get a very high resolution picture of a, of a protein, if you look at it at two angstrom resolution, for instance, where you can see where every atom is in three-dimensional space, it becomes pretty obvious very often what the protein does. And in the case of this, this protein, um, I went to Bob Stroud's lab and, and, and Sort of quit my teaching career and took up research again. So I was a, a postdoc at age 48, um, with a significant decrease in salary, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fascinating. It got me back in the lab. Um, and I wasn't a structural biologist. I didn't. I knew very little about X-ray crystallography. So I had to learn a whole new discipline and, and the techniques that go with it, which are very challenging. Um, but I found it fascinating much the same way I found working with an electron microscope and peering into a world that nobody ever sees. And that's, you know, that's a two angstrom resolution. And so I learned how to do uh, x-ray crystallography and I, uh, I finally um, crystallized the uh, MIP26 molecule, which is now called HPC0, aquaporin zero. And, uh, that was sort of the pinnacle of my research career was getting that high resolution structure and deducing how that protein worked. And then um, I retired from UCSF and um, while I was a postdoc, I wanted to hedge my bets because I was still not making a huge amount of money. And um, I got a call that was perfectly serendipitous out of the blue from a guy who had heard that I knew about integral membrane proteins and he had a, an interesting business opportunity for somebody with expertise in uh, integral membrane proteins. And this was um, to follow up on work that won the Nobel Prize in 2004, I think, for the, uh, by Linda Buck and Richard Axel deduced the way that olfaction works and the sense of smell. And, um, as it turns out, smell is very similar to vision. And so I had a lot of knowledge on vision, the visual system and how it worked already. So, and then I had that expertise, you know, 20, 30 years of expertise on integral membrane protein. So I, uh, I jumped at the chance to uh, sort of spend weekends talking with a group of four, a total of four guys, three other guys and myself, and we started a company. Uh, which is now Aroma, the Aromics Corporation. And what we're trying to do is make a sensor array that uses the human olfactory receptor protein um, in a plate, in a plastic uh, microwell plate um, that mimics the way the nose works. But the great thing about it is that we put the whole biochemistry of the nose in this plate and then we see how odors stimulate the receptors and we can record exactly the response of the receptors to odorants. And uh, we can record them. So now we have the technology that allows us really to take a, a photograph, if you will, or a recording of a smell, which has never been able to be done in the past. So, so is your company the only company that's doing this? No, we're, we're not the only company. There are several companies that are sort of contemporaneous with us. It's, it's new. Um, obviously, if, if the Nobel Prize was won in 2004, then sometime in the late 90s is when, you know, sort of the biochemistry and the cell biology of olfaction was, was being produced. And um, as it turned out, it works just the same way as many other regulatory proteins called GPCRs, G protein coupled receptors work. And uh, that's a hot topic now in the last 15 years. It's been very 
not. About 40% of all drug targets target deep protein coupled receptors. So all of your, um, you know, almost all of your blood pressure medications target GPCRs. Um, anything that has to do with regulating neuronal activity, neurotransmitter activity are GPCRs. Because GPCRs are the receptors that bind to the neurotransmitters that your neurons make. So anytime your nerve fires, a sig one nerve fires a signal to another, it's that signal is being intercepted by a GPCR, a deep protein coupled receptor. And so that's very similar to the to rhodopsin, which is also a GPCR, but is in the retina of the eye. So there was a lot of cell biology similarities between the visual system and the and the olfactory system. So that was always been very good. Well, so um, one of the things that I was reading about on your website that I found quite fascinating is that, that this olfactory sense is also distributed throughout the body. It's not just in the nasal passage. Exactly, that's so right. So how, how can that be? <laughs> well, you know, nature is amazing that they ne nature never wastes anything and nature never does anything inefficiently believe it or not, and especially as, a, as I've looked my whole life at the, at the function of, of the body and the cells, it's remarkably um, conservative in what it, when, it, when it devises a protein to do something, it makes use of that protein. And we look at these GPCRs, whether they're rhodopsin in the retina that allows us to see light and sense light, or whether it's a, a, an olfactory GPCR in the nose, they're very, very similar proteins. And uh, as a matter of fact, the olfactory receptor proteins are in the same subclass as, as rhodopsin, called the rhodopsin class of GPCRs. So they function almost identically. They have almost identical molecular and atomic structure. They behave the same way. They influence the same kind of signaling pathways. And so we can take advantage of that. But they respond to a different stimuli. They do. Rather than energy, light energy, they respond to chemicals. So what, um, this may be more tech, I, I don't, I'm just going to ask the question. So they respond to different stimuli. Are you able to ascertain how, how, it, how it's different? I mean, if the, if the protein in the eye is responding to light, I assume, mm -hmm. but the, the, protein, this very similar protein that exists in the nasal passages and, and in other parts of the human anatomy is responding to um, the gas molecules that are, that are making up the, the aroma. Is that correct? Yes, right. Yeah, so light comes into it, the is it, One is a photon and one is a gas molecule. And so... But the, the, the difference in the visual system is that when a photon comes into these chemicals, it causes a chemical reaction, which causes a, a change in something called retinal that, that, that is essentially a chemical change that, that the rhodopsin senses and then is stimulated to give a signal. And that's sort of the interesting thing about the G protein coupled receptors is they can respond to a number of different things like light or, or an odorant molecule or a neurotransmitter, but that's only half of what they do. The other half of what they do is, is initiate a signaling cascade or a transduction, which causes other downstream cha um, changes in the cell. So much like insulin will bind to the insulin receptor, which is a GPCR, and cause changes in the cell. The same thing happens with olfactory proteins, where when you get an olfactory molecule binding to the receptor, it activates the receptor. That then activates a chain of other proteins called the G, other G proteins the, um, that are coupled to the receptor, the alpha, beta, gamma G proteins. They then influence other things and stimulate other things like adenylate cyclase, which causes ATP to be converted to cyclic AMP. And, and in that way, open channels that cause a signal to go to your brain. So they work very similarly to, you know, how they work in, in the uh, retina of the eye. So biochemists 
cell chemically, they're very interesting. They're, they're a self amplifying system, for instance. So you can have one light molecule come into the retina and be perceived by, or be, be um, absorbed by that molecule. And that can cause tens of thousands of cyclic AMP molecules to be made. So it gives us very, very sensitive ability to bound to the, they say that they can, they can measure the, the impact of one light, one photon on the retina. If it hits in the right place, it can, be, it can be measured, the response can be measured. And the same thing with olfaction, where very, very low femtomolar amounts of, of odorants can stimulate um, different cellular activity because they're so sensitive. So it's, it's, it's just a perfectly engineered system for what we want it to do. There's, we humans have about 400 olfactory receptors and they allow us theoretically to, to sense about a trillion different chemical chemicals in, in the environment. So, and dogs have a lot more receptors, right? Dogs have anywhere from 800 to 1200 receptors. Mice have about 2000, or not quite 2000, about 1400. 1600 and oddly enough elephants are the winner in the mammalian class uh, having about a little over 2000 olfactory receptors so odd well but, i didn't know that about elephants but but my daughter is a great fan of dogs and so she's always watching all these dog videos that talk about their wonderful smell receptors mm -hmm. and um how they can smell even like one molecule of some odorant inside of a football stadium. <laughs> right. Yep. Seems kind of unbelievable. But they can also sense um, different kinds of cancers and detect certain kinds of illnesses. And I understand that your company is also working on that. I wonder right. if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, looking at the, the sort of anecdotal evidence that dogs seem to be able to smell different um, cancers, for instance. Um, we're working with Johns Hopkins and MIT groups at both of those institutions to look at, use our olfactory sensor array to see if we could detect the biomarkers that seem to be produced from cancer, cancerous cells. And so we have uh, urine samples that we're using from people with prostate cancer. And we have control samples of healthy people, and then we have people that do have cancer, and then people that have been treated for the cancer. And we're trying to see if our arrays can match the efficacy of the dog. So the dogs are better than any clinical diagnostic technique right now. They're in the, in the low 90% uh, being able to diagnose or, or detect these biomarkers. And that's better than the current lab protocols that uh, are used now. So they're very sensitive and um, they seem to be very accurate. So we think we can do the same thing. But, you know, people say, well, what's the difference between a human nose and a dog nose? And really, there is no difference between them. The, set. the only difference really is the dog has about a thousand times more surface area with that big nose they have. Um, to the, you know, they can just have more receptors. Um, and dogs, and this is, here's an interesting sort of connection with evolution, is that we see humans have, if you look at, in the human genome, you'll see that humans actually have about 1,200 olfactory genes um, still in the genome, but they're non-functional. They've been corrupted by physical insults and mutations to the point where they don't function anymore, but you can still see remnants of those genes in the human genome. So the humans still have the remnants of maybe 1,000 or 1,200 olfactory receptors, but there's only 400 that are actually functional that we know of. So, so, so that brings up another question that I want to throw in there, and that is that um, I read, well, okay, I've I follow a blogger who has anosmia, so otherwise I wouldn't know what it is. <laughs> um, but then after I started reading her and she talks about how taste is so affected by smell. So if you lose your sense of smell, you really lose your sense of taste. Right. And then I, I was trying to read up on anosmia and, and discovered that sometimes as people get older, 
they begin to lose their sense of smell. And so one of the tests that they actually do for, well, I guess it's also related to Alzheimer's, that one of the tests that they do for Alzheimer's is to see how close a jar of peanut butter has to be to you before you can smell it. Now, um, so that got me to thinking because I've been losing my sense of smell a little bit and I certainly don't want to be one of those people that ends up with Alzheimer's. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, is there any way that, that this, um, this is probably a very stupid question, but that this loss of the sense of smell, um, that, that it, it could be kind of, that it could kind of both go both ways that if you could refresh the sense of smell that that would also that maybe there's something about the fact that we have this ability to differentiate different smells and to see things clearly and so forth that that actually continues to uh, fire neurons and wire our brain to keep our brain active and that when our brain becomes less active because we are not experiencing as much of this neuronal firing then we begin to lose brain capacity does that make any sense that could be i wouldn't rule that out um although people generally you know you're constantly smelling things all the time even if you're not conscious of it um so your sense of smell is always being stimulated your brain has pathways and, and mechanisms to sort of silence it so you don't it doesn't distract you from all the other things you do. Otherwise, we'd all act like dogs sniffing constantly everything. <laughs> so uh, you, mean, so you mean you could lose you could lose your sense of smell, you, you could lose your ability to to notice the smell, but your brain is still it still knows that there's signals coming in. I see. I see. The sense of smell is it goes up from the neurons in your nose going up into your brain they 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 uh the first there's just the neurons that have the the olfactory receptors and then there is the nerves of the olfactory bulb which is just above your eyes there's two olfactory bulbs that sit right about here and so it's just a couple of centimeters away from the actual epithelium in your nose where you smell actually the, the odorant molecules are and so those neurons that have the receptors then synapse with neurons in your olfactory bulb and the olfactory bulb is the first cranial nerve so it's there's 12 cranial nerves those are nerves that actually directly connect to your central nervous system in one neuronal jump essentially and um just like the you know all the other the other 11 cranial nerves um so it has a direct connection right to your brain and and it seems to go to a very old part of the brain, if you will, that we see even recapitulated in reptiles and things like that. So it's obvious that um, olfaction was probably the earliest sense that people had, or that, that organisms had. And, it, and through evolution, it, it developed vision. So we think that, that actually olfaction is, is an earlier sense than, than, uh, than vision. So first olfaction evolved, and then it got changed to the vision, or vision was added to our senses. Because we can see chemical sensation even in one-celled organisms. You can see a yeast move down a gradient of pheromones. So yeast, two little yeasts that you use for baking bread, they actually have sexes. There's an alpha and an A sex of yeast, and they they mate sexually and they find each other by a pheromone that they give off. And one, one yeast has a, gives off a pheromone and the other one follows that gradient through the use of these olfactory receptors so that they can find each other and, and mate. So we see that even in very, very you know, single cell organisms. Even though they can't see, they can smell. Uh huh. Wow. There are worlds that we know nothing of. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So, so what are some of the other um, products and solutions that your company has has come up with that that uh, industry and medicine and so forth are finding interesting? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we touched on one and that was that these, these olfactory receptors that are not localized in the nose, but rather throughout the body are called ectopic receptors, olfactory receptors. And they're, they line the gut, for instance. And we think that they are very influential in, in really setting your whole metabolism and the whole sort of thermostat of your body, if you will, because they take sensory cues from whatever your microbiome in your gut is producing. Let's say you, you eat something and it, it ferments or it gets degraded into some other substance and that substance will stimulate a particular olfactory receptor in your stomach lining. That stomach lining is close to another type of our nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And that's the kind of unconscious nervous system that we have, either the sympathetic system that stimulates us in the flight or fight syndrome or scenario, or just the opposite calms us down. So that's the parasympathetic system. And those neurons that are in the lining of your stomach are very close anatomically to the autonomic nervous system. So it's not inconceivable that they wouldn't have a direct connection to that autonomic nervous system. So what you eat could have a very direct influence on your metabolic rate. Things like when you feel satisfied after you've eaten, for instance, how do you know that you've eaten? You know, your stomach might stretch, you feel uncomfortable that you've eaten, but also you have this satiety signal that tells you that you've eaten enough. And that is probably through olfactory receptors. So if we wanted to work on a, a cure for obesity, for instance, or ways to control obesity, we could probably do that through signaling through the gut. Um, and, and we're just starting to look at, at the microbiome in the gut, for instance, but there's also we see these receptors are in the kidney, so they can be in, useful in, in looking at kidney disease. Uh, we see them in the reproductive system. We think that, for instance, the sperm finds the egg through the use of olfactory receptors. Wow. 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 Um, you know, it, it's all over the place. And again, it comes back to that thing that nature never wastes anything. Once they found this cool little chemical biological system where one thing can talk to another through chemical signals, it, it doesn't get rid of that because it's an elegant way of doing things. Even if you look in the embryology of, of the or, or organism, so early in the development of a human, there's three primordial stem cells. The, and, and how they turn into muscle and organs and bones and nerves and all those other things um, are probably based also on olfactory receptors. Because how do you know, how does a muscle, for instance, how, do, how does a muscle form just the way it does with a tendon on each end and an, an insertion to one point and, an, and a, you know, and a tendon connecting to another area? Well, that's done through a pre-planned and, and probably these olfactory receptors are instrumental in making sure that, they, that the cells grow in the right direction, that they grow together with the right other cells, and so that you can actually form a, a functional embryo. Well, so you're the first person I've heard say that, which is, and, and it's very interesting to me because I've, I've listened to other guys talk about, um, there's one guy that, He's a little bit woo, and that's Rupert Sheldrake. I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and he has talked a lot about how DNA does not have a set of instructions for how things are supposed to fit together in the body. DNA is simply a set of instructions about the parts, what the parts are and what parts you get, but not how to assemble the parts. Right. And so he came up with this theory called morphic resonance, that the body has a, that there's some sort of um, universal memory of how bodies have been put together in the past, and that that universal memory is out there in the universe, and that that whenever a new body begins to form, it it uh, it integrates this universal memory to know how to form and that that's this morphic resonance. I'm not probably articulating it the way that he would, but that's the basic concept. 
Mm -hmm. But but what you're saying um, makes so much more sense that 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 this olfactory system is actually a kind of a communication system that allows the parts to talk to each other to know how to assemble. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And so, you know, those are just some of the things that we can, that I hope that our elucidation of how the olfactory system works, um, you know, I think we hope that we can figure this kind of thing out, how these things work. Um, you know, and, and so there's a lot of things that we do in human health that I think our, our sensor array can help us figure out. Um, but probably primarily it's like just how to figure out how olfaction works. How does the brain process um, olfactory information? You know, if we look at the way the retina works, there's three different proteins in the retina that detect red, blue, and green. And through those red, blue, and green pigment, and their GPCRs also, we can detect all the colors of the rainbow. Um, you look at the olfactory system, we have 400. So it's probably a lot more complicated than just the three that are in the, in the visual system. And how they talk to one another and how they interact with one another, we just don't know because really the state of the art is that out of the 400 receptors, only about one quarter is the actual odorant that triggers the receptor known. So we call the ones that we don't know what turns them on, we call those orphan receptors. So these orphan receptors are the huge majority, over 300 receptors, we don't know how to turn them on. We don't know what chemical actually turns them on. And the, one of the reasons is because these, these proteins are very hard. They're integral membrane proteins, they're embedded in the membranes of the, of the cell. They don't like to be just in water and they don't like to be only in lipid either. So they're sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type of proteins. They're not happy um, in some of the classical ways that we use to study them and separate them so we can study them further. Um, we can use detergents that mimic the membrane that allow them to be purified, for instance, and studied in other biochemical assays. Um, but they're really difficult to work on. And, and in probably 25 or 30 years of work, only about, if you read the, the publications, only about um, 50 of them have been deorphanized. So we have a big job, our company has a big job ahead of us, and that's this deorphanization project, and that is to figure out what turns on every single receptor. I mean, we found in, in dealing with some of our customers that sometimes we only need one receptor to solve their problem. For instance, we worked with a lemon juice company that wanted to be able to tell what, or a beverage company that used lem, a lot of lemon juice, and they wanted to be able to test lemon juice to see if we could tell degraded lemon juice from good lemon juice. And we found one receptor that, that lit up in the presence of bad, bad lemon juice. So now that customer can use just, all they need is one of these receptors. And we've gotten the cost down to about $10 a test. So it's a very cheap test that they can use to tell whether a shipment of a truckload or a train load of lemon juice is fresh or not. What they'd have to do in the past is have a, a human testing panel. That's the lemon juice, write down what they wanted to, you know, what they described the lemon juice as. And if they all agreed that it was good, then they'd accept that shipment of lemon juice and they'd use it for making their beverages. But writing down descriptions in human language is about the worst way you can transfer information. It doesn't flow well into our sort of computerized world that we live in now. And so what we want is real, hard, biochemically derived numbers. Um, and that's what, our, that's what our sensor array gives us, is real biochemical numbers that are, you know, you'll get the same answer every single time you do it. Um, they're, they're quantifiable, they're measurable, and they, you know, they're good scientific data that they've mm -hmm. never had before. I mean, there are other techniques, analytical techniques like mass spec, mass spectrometry and gas chromatography that are used widely now, but they take a long time. We're hoping that our sensor, when it's in its sort of go-to-market form, will um, will give a reading in about 10 minutes. And so, uh, and not require PhDs and a million dollar piece of equipment. 
So we want something that you can use in a laboratory, but we also want something that a farmer can use. Mm -hmm. And so we're making sensors that give a sort of a, a binary yes, no type of answer. You know, is this bad thing present or not? Is this malodor present or not? Is this fruit or crop ripe or not? So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. And what's really amazing is the, the, the wide spectrum of, of industries that have had these very hard um, pain points that they haven't had a solution for. And it seems like whole faction can, can answer their questions in an elegant way. Well, so I'm, I'm still, I, I'm tracking everything that you're saying here, but I'm also still back on what you said about the eye. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about the olfactory receptors and the orphan receptors and that you only have like 50 that have been deorphanized, mm -hmm. it sounds as though the olfactory receptors are very specific as to what they respond to. And the, 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 um, receptors in the eye, you said there are three proteins, each of which responds to red, green, and blue. And then you made a statement that didn't sound, didn't make sense to me when you said, so it's much simpler than the olfactory system. But, but as an artist, and, and even, even with a, just a mild interest in photography, I know that red, green, and blue have to be applied in the right proportion <laughs> in the right order in the right you know in, in everything in order to produce the color that you want it's not it's not that you can just take red green and blue and dump them together because if you do that you just get seems to me you get white is that right you, you put all three of them together you just end up with white whether you're talking about light color or whether you're talking about pigments and paint. right so if you take pigment and throw it all together you get black or something black. approaching mud so, so it's a very delicate balance, and mm -hmm. that sounds like miraculous to me that there is a way that those things can balance out to accurately reproduce color in the human eye. But then when you talk about the olfactory system, it sounds like each receptor is just responding to a specific odorant and maybe a kind of smell is made up of a number of different odorants that are combined together. And so there are a number of receptors that are affected by a particular smell. Right. Like perfumes are put together with a number of different fragrances in order to produce a certain fragrance profile. Right. right? Yep. So um, it actually sounds as though the olfactory system is a simpler mechanism than the the I. Well, if you can imagine, we talk about it in sort of multi-dimensional space. If you look at the uh, visual system, that's a that's three dimensions that can be changed, and and you can see that when you look at our RGB coordinates. So if I want to, you know, remake the red in my shirt, I can I can figure out what the RGB coordinates are and give them to somebody on the other side of the world, and they can make that color and identically because they know what the mixing rules are if you will whether it's light or pigment i mean you know you can go to home depot with a color of your favorite swatch of color and they can match perfectly because they know the algorithms for mixing but how does our brain know the mixing the mixing rules well it does because it's multi-dimensional space for instance i see that picture behind you for instance has purple in it but we don't have a purple receptor so mm -hmm. what's the brain doing? It's it's integrating the difference between the red and the blue so that you perceive purple. But there's no purple light being right. Not, you don't have a purple receptor, for instance. Right. I, I know, but that that's the mystery of the whole thing, right? I mean that the brain is is processing these colors, deciding. I mean that there is some sort of a rule bank <laughs> that is telling the RGB, what, what, the, uh, what the proportions are. Right. Well, now, now imagine that there's 400 different pigments and they're all, re they're all responding to different chemistries, for instance. Like we'll have, we have one receptor that, that binds to alcohol, long chains, linear alcohol. So you might have a seven, seven carbon 
molecule with an alcohol on the end. Well, that receptor probably, it, we find that it, it optimally sets off or it, it'll maximally stimulate the receptor if it's seven carbons long. But it will, that receptor will also respond to five carbon chain alcohols or six or eight or nine or 10. They just not as, not as strongly as they do with a seven because the seven fits like a key in a, in a lock. It just ah, okay. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. That stimulates it, and it it's so elegant. Some of these um, these receptors that they can even separate the difference between what we call enantiomers. These are chemically identical uh, identical chemicals have exactly the same number of carbons, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they're just assembled as mirror images, like our hands. Mm -hmm. Hands, they don't overlap, right? But they're the same number of fingers, same number of bones and everything else. Well, that's the same way with caraway, the smell of caraway seeds and, and spearmint. Those are enantiomers of one another. They're chemically identical. They're just arranged in a handed way. One's a right-handed version and one's a left-handed version. And we have receptors that will be stimulated by one, but not the other. So that, that is so weird, but it, it makes perfect sense when you think that the binding pocket in that integral membrane protein is made to fit just like a glove. And maybe it'll, it'll, it'll fit a right hand, but it will never fit a left hand. And that's because of just the way the, the chemistry of the binding pocket is, where there's negative concentrations of negative charge or positive charge or hydrophobic nature or constrictions in it where it can only be a linear a linear molecule, not a globular molecule. Well, what amazes yeah. me is how fortunate aeromics is that they found you. <laughs> <laughs> because it seems like your skill set fits like a glove with what they need. I, I can't imagine how they could even approach um, the kind of science that they're trying to do without someone with your kind of background and skill set. Um, did it? Did you feel like you had sort of fallen into Alice in Wonderland when you got this call? <laughs> I certainly did because it was completely serendipitous how I linked up with the CEO of our company. Um, I had an insurance an insurance agent with the gift of gab, like all insurance agents, and of course he was my insurance agent, so he was always asking me what I was doing, and he seemed fascinated with what I was doing. So I was telling him about structural biology of integral membrane proteins. And then he was off doing something else and he called an old contact at IBM um, to reconnect with this guy. And that guy had moved on. He wasn't even at um, IBM anymore at the Almaden Research Center. And uh, it just so happens that our CEO had taken over that guy's desk and his phone. And so the phone rang and he answered and my uh, insurance agent struck up a conversation with our CEO and started asking him what he was doing. And he said, well, I'm leaving IBM and I want to start a company that works with integral membrane proteins. And he goes, oh, I know somebody that, <laughs> how do you figure that kind of stuff out? I mean, I won't say it was a miracle, but pretty close. <laughs> well, yeah, if you tried to write that into a book, nobody would believe it. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, it's it perfectly serendipitous and lucky for everybody. And um, it also means, you, you know, your state of mind. You have to be receptive. The other postdocs, another, my mentor at, at the UCSF thought I was, he didn't think I was an idiot, but he thought it was a real long shot. And it, you know, it took about three or four years of uh, weekend mornings talking about how we could what we have to do in the science and what we have to do in the business and how we meld those two together to make a, a function, you know, a going concern. I had no, I was a president of a junior achievement company back when I was in high school. That's the sum total of my business acumen. And so really what I've gone through is, is you know, an MBA degree in the last five years, essentially, mm -hmm. learning about the business, um, you can't be the CSO of a company, the chief scientific officer without, especially something that's just technical without, I'm the one that they go bring in for the dog and pony shows for the investors and, and for customers and things like that, because I can explain it fairly well. 
and um, you know, you just have to you learn a lot about business and and you learn how remarkable it is. You know, when we're when you're in academia, many of the professors think of business as like the evil empire. You know, oh, you're going out for a profit. You're not like us. You know, godlike people who are doing it only for the betterment of uh, the universe or whatever. But uh, it it takes a lot of communication between people, and I've been remarkably. Um, I've just been um, really impressed at how communication-based business is. That I, we have been told about, oh, you should talk to this guy, you should talk to that guy. You know, this guy can help you with something, or well, you go see that guy and he'll talk to you. And you know, it's just been very uh, collaborative. So I've been very uh, wonderfully surprised at how how the business world, especially in Silicon Valley, has worked. Like any company, we are always running after money. We're in a funding round right now. Um, we're talking to people. We're talking to people from all over the world. We have investors from all over the world. Um, we have companies from all over the world that we deal with. And the funny thing is, is, is people came to us with a lot of ideas, like the automotive industry. The first time an automotive in, uh, company came to us, we didn't really think there was any way we could do anything for them. And um, they said no. And so we shooed them away. And the first, first automotive company that came to us, we said, we can't help you. you know, we got other things we're dealing with. We're a young company. We got to close it. Um, but then more and more companies came to us with problems. And for instance, like the new car smell. You know, almost everybody in the world likes the new car smell, but it's completely accidental. It's just a mixture of the adhesives and the fabrics and the foam and the plastics they use in the car. It comes out to be what we call the new car smell, but it's not engineered. And sometimes it's a little heavy on certain things, like something goes wrong in the polymerization process of the foam and it smells bad and gives people a headache. And so what do you do when somebody's bought a $40,000 car that they can't drive in? And so, and then they found out that the Chinese, which is now the largest market for cars in the world, the Chinese don't want any smell. And so now the car companies are scrambling. How do we get rid of the smell? Now they go, how do we measure the smell? And that's when they come to us and say, do you have a way of measuring the smell so that we can get rid of it? Hmm. Or at least we can control it. And then we have other car companies that want to engineer the environment within these autonomous cars that they promise we're going to have. And so they want to have people that are stimulated to have a good buying experience in the car, or they want to know, can we, develop cues to keep them alert or quiet them down or things like that can they in influence their mood essentially and we can do that too so one of the things you're working on is a kind of a cone of silence <laughs> <laughs> something that can that can um, erase smells yeah I mean obviously that's a big problem now odor you know, there's there's good odors and there's bad odors. And when there's bad odors, people want to get rid of them. And it's a huge, it's a multi-billion dollar industry in America alone uh, to get rid of different smells. And uh, we have a, we have a uh, collaboration right now with a large chemical company that wants to get more recycled plastic, for instance. And um, one of the problems with recycling plastic, especially for food packaging, is it really can't have any bad sm smells in it. And, and plastic is actually quite porous and absorptive. It absorbs smells. So if you do the usual rate where you take a, a, a virgin water bottle and you throw it in landfill, and then you pull it out a month later or whatever, it's going to smell terrible. And you never know what people do with plastic too. They might fill a, a, a two liter pop bottle with insecticide to mix it. They might put gasoline in it or something like that. And it's to the point now that the chemical companies, when they recycle plastic, they can no longer have humans test the plastic. With the virgin plastic, they know what's in it. It's a defined chemical mixture. They know that it's not harmful to humans. So when they do a new batch of virgin resin to make, let's say, a water bottle or a plastic wrap for some food product, they can actually have people test those. But when you don't know where that plastic has been, the OSHA says you cannot have humans test that. So now they're in a real pickle that they can't even have humans test this to see if it's bad. And so we have a collaboration with this company and we ran 
their plastic pellets. So they sent us pellets, plastic pellets with uh, virgin plastic pellets, post-consumer recycled plastic pellets, and then pellets that they have remediated in some way to lower the, the, uh, the smells. And we, uh, one of our, just one of our sensors was, uh, was able to differentiate between the virgin plastic and the uh, remediated plastic versus the uh, raw post-consumer recycled plastic. So now we have, again, a single, very, very cheap, very rapid test that this company can use to, you know, judge how good and how ready their plastic is to be used in, in food recycling. Because only about 2% of plastic is recycled right now, which is just ridiculous. That all the rest of it is either burned or put into landfill or thrown in the ocean. So they really need this kind of technology if they're going, this is sort of a fundamental one that people don't even think about that's, that's really just interrupting the whole recycling process of plastic. Mm -hmm. But uh, Well, I can see that that kind of stuff uh, must make it kind of exciting to get up in the morning and know that you're helping human flourishing. Yes, yes. And that's, you know, that is what science is all about. And that, that is what is, has made me enthusiastic about it from the time I was five years old until until now. That uh, just the wonderment and 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 again, sort of circling back to the idea of faith. The more I see and the more science shows me, the just the more I am so impressed with how everything happens. Whether I'm looking up at the universe and the stars. Or whether I'm peering through an electron microscope or looking at a, a structure of X-ray crystallography at two angstroms, it just fascinates me, and that, and that's why I do what I do. I love what I find. I am completely blown away every time I find something new. And um, you can argue all you want about no divine intervention, but um, you don't have to. Not an, it's not a discussion you even have to have, really. You just have to have an open mind and open eyes and look around. And to me, it's self-evident. So I, I have one more question for you. Okay. And I, I asked my daughter this morning, if, if she could ask you one question, what would it be? And she said, well, you know, fragrances are very nostalgic. So do you have a fragrance that is very nostalgic for you, a smell that, that brings back memories for you? You know, that's sort of, that, that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm not a great smeller. Um, I smell every chemical that we get in the, in the lab, um, just out of curiosity. And we have hundreds and hundreds of different odorant molecules. Um, they're all food grade. Here. Um, so no, there isn't really anything that, um, that's my favorite smell. Um, well, you know how sometimes a smell will trigger a memory, it will bring back oh, definitely. Bring back full force the memory of a moment. For me, this is kind of strange, but there's, there was a, a, a moment when I was in high school when I smelled a certain, I think it was a kind of a soap maybe. I can still smell that fragrance. I've looked for it for all these years trying to find that fragrance that I might have it again because I loved that smell so much. If I ever ran into it again when I smelled it, even the memory of smelling it takes me back to that moment. Right. But I've never been able to find that fragrance again. Mm -hmm. and, um, but but there are other fragrances that will, will just call up a memory just like that. And right. uh, it almost seems to me like that there might be a business model in that because yes. people yes. love nostalgia, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, definitely. I mean, uh, I think everybody gets triggered that way. I certainly do. I grew up on the north in the northeast, and the smell of burning leaves in the autumn is a smell that immediately takes me back to my childhood. Um, the smell of certain woods burning, um, cookies baking reminds me, you know, brings back memories of my mother and my grandmother's baking, pies, things like that. Love all those those things, and they do exactly do that. And as an aside, one of the things we're looking at is helping people with post-traumatic stress disorder to work through some of the memories that they have through olfaction. 
So wow. there are ways you can do that. So you mean cycle through a certain number of, of um, aromas to kind of rewrite the memories? Yep. I'm not the psychiatrist or the psychologist that uh, has thought about that, but we've had we've been approached by people that want to use it for that kind of therapy. So. Yeah, I, I can kind of see it. I can kind of see it. Yep. Well, it's been absolutely delightful, Bill. Thank you for giving me so much of your time. Well, thank and, you. Uh, I, man, I wish you and your company all the best. And are you hiring? Because <laughs> we are hiring. I, I know some young people who are studying um, biomedical engineering right now. And it seems like that would be right in your wheelhouse. Exactly. No, we love every opportunity to talk to young people that are interested in, in olfaction or, you know, have some sort of expertise that, uh, or a desire to go down this, this path. We're very open to having people. We have for interns right now. So we always have a place for interns if they want to just put their toe in the water and see what it's like. You also need software engineers though, right? Uh, yeah, we have software. We, we definitely have a, um, so in order to figure out this 10 dimensions of olfaction, uh, it takes people with uh, artificial intelligence experience, program experience, machine learning experience. We are talking to all those people. We have a, a collaboration with Santa Clara University right now. They're uh, for this a AI work. Mm -hmm. We're we're getting we're doing an app right now that will take um, verbal data, so people's verbal descriptions of, of different things that they can sense. And what we want to do is take that verbal data because there's a lot of data out there from testing panels, for instance. And generally, it's of absolutely no use once they've okayed a batch of shampoo or something to be bottled and sold off. They don't go back to that because it's this clunky verbal information and it's not numbers. It's not something they can actually compete with. Um, but in order to get, you know, the verbal data, the mass spectrometry and, and gas chromatography data and any other kind of data, and then verbal data from all sorts of different languages for instance we were talking to l'oreal and they have laboratories in south america and north america europe and africa and asia and when all these people get on a on a you know a conference call and they say oh this this new fragrance that we're going to have smells like a flower well there's five different flowers that come to people's minds immediately an asian flower an african flower a north american flower and they're all talking about the, something different you know, when, when they use verbal communication. So if we can give them an RGB standard that they can all agree on, it makes communication through these multinational companies, especially the fragrance houses and the flavor houses, it makes it much easier mm -hmm. for them to communicate and be on the same page. Essentially. And that goes for everybody that deals with flavor and fragrance. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. Great. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Bill. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.